all'interno di questa sezione so in my presentation the camp after the camp I'm going to talk about the transit of lives of wishes of tensions which are so profoundly different in a place that is bound to stay in the same place uh, you have different destinies that are that cross each other or maybe you have the same destiny that shows itself with its differences in a place that is bound to stay. So we're talking about so different lives, such different lives that they disrupt the whole meaning of a place. They have opposites coexist. So this is a camp, but at the same time, it is also an ideal city. It is one thing and also its contrary. The alternation of such uh, contrasting uh, events uh, make this place as a suspended place in the meaning we attach to it. The topic I'm going to talk about sees children as protagonists at the beginning, about 800 children who are the little, the young ap ap apostles, and the priest, a very creative priest, Don Zeno Saltini. See, if you bring together the craziness of uh, uh, children and a radical Christianity and you get uh, a bomb, an explosive bomb, that's May 1947, and papers uh, highlight this occupation, which is a peaceful and provocative occupation at the same time. It is writers and at the same revolutionary at the same time. Don Zeno asks uh, authorities for permission, but he's not uh, waiting for their answer because there's an informal agreement with the director of the Center for Refugee uh, uh, Collection and the camp is occupied by the children and by Don Zeno. The name of the city is, uh, is a city which is sort of uh, built there during my last visit to Nomadelfia, which is now in Grosseto. Actually, they insisted on the fact that uh, the city was built the city is built so it's a bill it's a it's a town which was built in the camp and the name of the town was nomadelfia that's the town in which brotherhood is the law and it was defined uh, by its same creators as the city of sun the city of god the city of love the city of hope and you have this community of the young apostles uh, who know that they can uh, um, play with the sentimental importance of their actions, actions whose aim is to bless a place that had been cursed. The pictures which are carefully created, I mean there is a, a very well created scenery in the back. I mean these pictures show the need for revenge, for redemption, for some kind of a vengeance or conversion after all the horrors of the war. And the young children appear to recognize their role as uh, heroes. Rumors have it that Don Zeno Saltini was asked by the very same children uh, uh, arriving at the camp, now that we're here, what can we do? To play, we want to play in this place in which we have nothing to play with. And rumors have it that Don Zeno Saltini answered, uh, why don't you uh, bring walls down? Just look at this. Look at the uh, young guy. He doesn't do anything. He is the chief. He sort of only directs the works. So we know that they are part of a certain religious tradition, that certain ideas are part of a certain religious uh, tradition like, uh, uh, for example, evangelization or conversion or exorcism. The exorcism of a, a place is the disenchantment of uh, cursed places. So you have this idea of converting certain places, which is an idea 
che fa parte, è un idea molto importante, che fa parte di una certa tradizione religiosa. It is an integral part of a given religious tradition. When I started this case for the first time, I had to acknowledge one fact. When asking the question, when asking myself the question, how was this possible? How come that a horrific place suddenly becomes a place in which uh, the joy of living reigns. And actually my answer was that joy and uh, pain cannot be confined. And when I talked that with my students and my colleagues, um, and I continue doing so, I continue uh, talking about this unique case uh, with my students that's really a unique case in the ca in the in the, in, the s in, in, in global architecture so when i talk about this with my students we would say okay it's architects uh, architects have to deal with uh, all those intermediate situations like well-being or comfort or um, they should not expect they should not want to in way limit the place of joy and the place of pain. Fortunately, fortunately, joy and pain cannot be confined. They have, they cannot be interned. Now, actually, I think this remark of mine is uh, no longer satisfactory. I think we should go on changing our intellectual arrogance. In this place, in this which used to be the concentration camp in February 1948, the members of the community gathered to discuss actually the plan of their ideal city. And Don Zeno was asked, how come that you can build an, a city uh, in very short time in this place? How can we build an ideal city? And his answer was, well, actually, uh, there was a geometer. Actually, I've always had this uh, ideal city in me. And he explained how the city was supposed to be by, I mean, he, uh, he should draw back to Renaissance ideals. I mean, the possibility of uh, drawing back to those principles. So the plan I wanted to uh, pursue with my design is made up of, uh, is, ba is based on this thought. That's a thought that I have had in me for years. I mean, enabling men to uh, to move from the room to the house, from the house to the village, and from the village to the city, and the other way around, in full freedom. And uh, uh, feeling this uh, feeling uh, of brotherhood. Uh, in any place. And in this respect, I'd like to thank the community of Nomadelfia for showing me this document. You can easily understand that the Renaissance ideals was very strong here. That ideal that goes back to the proportions of a harmonic world that can resonate here. And then everything precipitated in 1952. Because in just five years, uh, a uh, stage, uh, a fundamental stage of this project, uh, of, the, of this life project uh, uh, ended. So Nomadelfia in the fossil camp. So there was a very short uh, renaissance. Just think about what it could have been now if Nomadelfia had continued existing. The reason for this failure, the reasons for this failure are manifold. Uh, there were political mistakes or also the fact that the members of the community on the occasion of the administrative elections of 1951 uh, sort of uh, cancelled the electoral uh, uh, sheets uh, by writing liberty, egality and fraternity of brotherhood. So basically there were diplomatic mistakes, lots of strong contrasts uh, with Italian politicians, uh, lots of fears. So the community of the young of the little apostles was uh, accused uh, to carry out communist, uh, hidden communist mysticism, and it was dismantled. More than 800 children were taken away from uh, the police by the police were blurries, and they were closed into orphanages.
So look, just think of the destiny of these young children who had already lost their parents again and they also lost these uh, kind of vocational uh, mothers who had welcomed them uh, in uh, their families. So the children were sent to orphanages, those who were uh, no longer, uh, those who were of age were sent and actually Don Zeno was then interdicted and the city was then banned and all the assets of the city were discounted uh, and Nomadelfia would then start again with lots of courage and lots of enthusiasm but just think of the fact that in 1950 here we had another major architect who would then play a major role in the project of Nomadelfia in Grosseto that is Danilo Dolci and Danilo Dolci is known as the Italian Gandhi so he did not complete his studies of architecture at the Polytechnico, at the Technical School of Milan. So before his dissertation, he left university and came to Nomadelfia to finish his studies. Um, this contrast became even more relevant, uh, this contrast between the horror and the beauty of those camp, of these sheds, of these uh, barracks, uh, is the conversion project uh, that was uh, implemented by an architect who was a, a former German soldier, Sigmund Herlinger. He uh, basically wrote into these notebooks, which were really very ordered. Actually, I think that photographs like these are really, are really evocative. They talk about the, the gap of the lack of meaning that this architect, architect was facing while he was uh, sort of uh, analyzing the camp. I am really impressed by the order, by the tidiness that you have in these empty rooms. Uh, the rooms that were photographed, and actually what speaks is the absence. So an architect that was probably, that had probably been trained by the same ones who had, who had trained Albert Speer, so the architect of the Führer. In the Nomadelfa archive, you have documents which are very important to me, which should be uh, filed and ordered, uh, the, for example, the draft, uh, the initial draft documents or preliminary studies, uh, or they include also some reliefs or uh, projects of the individual um, buildings. You see the projects, uh, the plan of the church. Uh, there were um, uh, computational calculations uh, as well as the projects for another village. Nomadelfia was initially conceived as a series of uh, villages that had to be developed in different places, not only in Fossoli. And this was supposed to basically um, be created near Mirandola. I would like to focus in particular on this drawing in which you have a barrack, and the barrack is sort of suspended between worlds of emotions which apparently are indifferent to it. So this meaning, the meaning of a project which is bound to uh, remain incomplete. So you have some kind of a chronicle absence. And then this letter. Once again, I would like to thank the archive of uh, uh, Nomadelfa and Mr. Francesco and the priest, Mr. Giovanni, Don Giovanni, who helped me in this research. The letter was written by the architect, by Sigmund Herlinger, to Don uh, Zeno on the 29th of May 1948. Dear Don Zeno, in, during your absence I came to the conclusion that I have to leave Italy and that I have to go back to my country. I have thought a lot about that, but and this decision was not taken uh, by me as a sudden decision, but it is rather the result of a very long reflection. I have been working for this project for two years and a half. I've worked on all the designs and all the projects, and we even built something. But uh, throughout these years, I also suffered a lot. I often suffered 
for tiny things, for small things. But actually, it is not these tiny things that uh, make life miserable. And then he goes on. I actually uh, have, uh, I share with you uh, a question that has always already been posed during this conference, and this question becomes clearer and clearer to me. It's a question which we should ask in a very precise way. And, I, and after studying and after researching and investigating uh, this kind of anomalous uh, Camp, uh, this uh, lawless uh, uh, camp. And the question is very simple. It is the following question. What is a camp? And probably this is not yet the right uh, formulation because we shouldn't talk so much of a what as was said before. How many walls should we fold down, should we bring down, and how many walls should we build to make a camp, to make and uh, demolish a camp? I mean, the wall that was demolished with a lot of emphasis was not enough to bring down the ideological walls that existed at the time and still exist outside the camp. A concentration camp so this is actually the case uh, that I wanted to present. Can be an ideal city. It can be an ideal city, and we've uh, uh, just talked about Drancy, and an ideal city can be a concentration camp. So between concentration camp and ideal city, you can have really horrific um, combinations and connections like the ones of Theresienstadt. So the camouflage operation that was not that necessary there of Theresienstadt was uh, um, uh, implemented by Eichmann and uh, his collaborators. So this question, what is a camp, and the answers to these questions have been uh, uh, often formulated by important philosophers and thinkers. The real concentration camp is uh, really subtle, and you find it uh, where you least expect to find it, while what is more evident, so the camp which is more evident, is all too often an illusion. It's a fake camp. So we are facing a place, we're dealing with a place which testifies to its possibility to be one thing and also its contrary. Just think that architects define this as uh, the polyfunctional, multifunctional liberty. We should consider this liberty, this freedom with great attention, because it is uh, intoxicating. It is the freedom to build places with no destiny or spaces that have no purpose, they have no meaning. Otherwise, uh, so basically they are means without an end. Thank you very much.